Excerpt. Your bed is cold, said a voice in the room that made her eyes go wide with fear. Nervously, she turned around, gulping softly to see a shadow on her bed, as if someone was lying there. The man who had been lying down sat up, emerging from the shadows where he had been waiting for her. What are you doing here? She asked when his feet touched the floor, and he pushed himself up to start walking toward her. His handsome features looked darker than usual because of the lack of light in the room. I came to meet you, he said, tilting his head. Where did you go? I went out for a walk, came the quick reply that had him smiling, a smile that scared her the most. She took a step back when he came closer. It didn't stop him from cornering her, and her back hit the wall behind her. He raised his hand toward her face, and she closed her eyes, scared. She shuddered when his fingers trailed down from her temple to her jaw and neck. Even her blonde hair was trembling. In the middle of the night? She didn't answer him, knowing he could decipher her lies through her words. He stepped closer, and she turned her face away from him, as his words vibrated on the skin of her neck. Did you go to meet him, my sweet girl? Despite her disinterest, Alexis McMillan was dragged to the illustrious Roosevelt family's annual masquerade ball, along with her older sister, in order to find rich husbands. Alexis made her best effort to spend the evening unnoticed by anyone, but a silver-masked stranger returned her missing handkerchief before asking to dance with her. After spending the rest of the evening evading his eager and arguably aggressive approach, Alexis returned home, only to have a betrothal letter from the king arrive at her house the next day. Enter His Royal Highness Nicholas, the greedy and narcissistic despot of the entire Devon region, the silver-masked stranger, a man who never took no for an answer because he never had to. Coerced into agreeing to a union with the most selfish and evil man she had ever met, will Alexis find a way to escape his clutches and marry the tailor of her dreams before living the simple life she had always desired? Or will she accept becoming the wife and queen of a man who treats people as tools? Invitation Not finding her mother or sister in the house, the girl made her way to the backyard, where she saw her mother and younger sister hanging the laundry on the clothesline. The sun was bright and warm enough to dry the clothes they had washed in the river. Mama, Alexis? Maggie called out. Stop shouting, Maggie. I'm sure even Mrs. Perkins can hear you over the fence, said the woman, who had an apron tied around her waist and her hair tied in a bun. What's gotten you so excited? She asked. Maggie smiled at her mother and showed her the envelope in her hand. Look what I received. There was a red seal on the envelope, which had been opened. It's an invitation to the Grand Ball of Hollow at the King's Castle, she informed her. That's not possible. Why would the King send an invitation to us? Her mother asked taking the letter from her as she noticed the seal on the outside. Oh well, I can't read it anyway. The Grand Ball of Hollow took place every year at the castle. It was an event that many people wished to attend, but it wasn't for lower-class people, only those who had worked for the king and his other acquaintances, who mostly hailed from the rich class, were usually invited. People like the Macmillan family didn't have the social standing to get such an invitation, which was why the woman wondered if her elder daughter had been imagining things. The younger daughter, Alexis, said, Let me take a look at that, Mama. She took the letter from her mother's hand and started reading what was written in it. Her brows furrowed as she turned to her mother. It is indeed an invitation from the king. Our name is written right here, she pointed out. I told you, the elder girl cried clapping her hands and coming to stand next to her younger sister, who was a few inches shorter than her. Maggie had dark brown hair that almost looked black, and eyes that were green in color, acquiring her features from her father, 
while the younger girl took after her mother's pale features, with blonde hair and brown eyes that had her living in her elder sister's shadow. What do you think? Should we go to the ball? Maggie asked. Alexis smiled at her sister, who was a year older than her. She looked very excited to attend the ball. It was obvious she'd been wanting to go there, like many other folks who couldn't afford to even step into the castle, and could only look at it from afar. Alexis's brown eyes shifted to look at her mother, who was deep in her thoughts. She could tell that her mother was calculating the cost if they were going to attend the ball. Birds suddenly flew up in the sky, chirping as they made their way toward the forest. Seeing the frown on her younger sister's face, Maggie said, The king has decided to be generous enough to invite many families to attend the ball this time, instead of limiting it to the wealthy few. I was right there in the market when I heard the announcement made in the village square. How kind of him, Alexis murmured under her breath. Based on what she had heard, the king was nowhere near generous and had the reputation of a cruel tyrant. People like her, or many of them who lived on this side of the village, had never seen him, but had only heard stories. Some good, but mostly bad. Are we going, Mama? It isn't every day that we're invited by the king and get the opportunity to see the castle, Maggie asked, eagerly awaiting her mother's response. We'll need gowns, shoes, and a carriage to travel, which we can't afford. Your father works really hard, and the little money we've saved is for one of you to get married and settle down while we seek the help of whoever gets married first, their mother replied. Maggie looked glum upon hearing this. The elder woman gave it some thought, her eyebrows knitted together. If one of her daughters were able to capture the interest of a man of high status, everything would fall into place. There were enough suitors already who were trying to woo her daughters. Like every mother, she had the best interests of her daughters in her heart, and wanted only to see them married and have a good life. I suppose you're right. It is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So you'll need to arrange the gowns, Maggie. I'll ask your father if he can arrange the carriage, said their mother, making Maggie scream in joy. Oh, Mom, thank you so much. I'll ask Mr. Brown if he can run us some gowns for that evening. Surely he wouldn't mind for a day. Alexis heard her elder sister speak excitedly and knew that she was already dreaming about it. You'll not mind if I take Alexis along with me, will you, Mama? Maggie asked before holding Alexis's hand and leaving. Don't go too far, their mother called out as the girl stepped out of the house. The woman knew that out of her two daughters, it was the elder one who was the most interested to go, and very keen on finding a suitor from those attending the ball at the castle. Maybe it was a good thing, and the probability of Maggie landing a husband was higher than it was for Alexis, as she was the prettier of the two. It would place her elder daughter in a better position, while it would also improve the Macmillan family's status and wealth. But no one knew what fate had in store. Taylor's Door Maggie, the shop won't close right away. We still have time, Alexis reminded her sister, who appeared to be in a hurry. Oh, shut up, Alexis. You don't know how people are going to be swarming the shop soon to get their clothes tailored or fitted. Knowing a lot of us can't afford it, there's going to be a long line when it comes to renting the gowns, said Maggie, walking with her sister as they made their way to the village's esteemed tailoring shop, owned by James Brown. It's right to take you along, as the man fancies you. It would make it easier for us to get our gowns from him. And just because you aren't interested in going to the ball or don't enjoy such things doesn't mean I shouldn't too, does it? Her sister added as she let out a hearty laugh. A smile appeared on Alexis's lips when she said, I never said I didn't want to go. I do wish to attend the ball. Don't be a whiny little girl then, Maggie murmured with a smile as she offered a quick wink to Alexis. If they weren't giggling, one would have thought Maggie was trying to demean her sister. But Alexis brushed it away, thinking it was just her sister being playful. Like many others from the surrounding villages and towns, 
Alexis wanted to go to the ball, but her purpose for going was different from that of her sister. Maggie wanted to place herself in the highest social standing, rather than live her life here in the village. Alexis was slightly hesitant going into the tailor shop, because it wasn't just Mr. Brown who fancied her. She liked the man, but neither of them had ever spoken about it. The most Alexis had done, so far, was smile at him. Once they reached the shop, as expected, there were many young girls and women, some of whom Maggie had seen receiving invitation letters from the messenger of the castle. Do you think he owns enough gowns for everyone? Alexis asked as she noticed how far the line outside the door stretched. By the time they reached the front, there might be none left. Of course he doesn't. The man barely owns five to ten good ones, which I believe have been given away by now. Maggie replied, looking at the entrance of the shop and then the line before she pulled Alexis towards the door. She pushed her sister to the front so that Mr. Brown would notice Alexis, which he did in less than a few seconds. To Maggie's calculated expectation, Mr. Brown excused himself from a customer by handing the work to his assistant so that he could talk to her sister. Alexis smiled when her brown eyes met with pale green ones. Mr. Brown stared at her and reverted her smile. Good afternoon, Mr. Brown, Alexis greeted him. Maggie didn't know why the man took such an interest in her younger sister, as she was the better looking of the two of them. He was quite a decent looking man for this village. Not caring about it as she had to get the gowns from him, she used her sister as a means to do so. How have you been doing, Mr. Brown? Maggie initiated the conversation. The man offered her a sweet smile. Very well, Maggie. The king gave out invitations to some of the families in and around the village. That's why we have a line of customers waiting to get their clothes. He informed her. He turned around to make sure his assistant was taking the right measurements, as it wasn't often they had this many people waiting in line. Are you here to buy something? He inquired of Maggie before his gaze fell on her younger sister, as if he was unable to take his eyes off her. Alexis, who felt her sister nudge her from behind, replied, We received an invitation to... You did? He asked, surprised to see Alexis nod. Did you get invited to the ball too, Mr. Brown? Asked Maggie, and the man smiled at her. I didn't, he said, laughing softly. I'm guessing you're here for the gowns. We were hoping we could rent a couple of them if possible. We'll make sure we return them in the same condition. Maggie politely asked with a smile of promise, in the hope that he would agree. They heard Mr. Brown say, I don't know about that. Some gowns will be given to the ones who are first in line. Alexis spoke up then. We don't mind gowns that look average. Please? Mr. Brown smiled helplessly and gave in. He opened the back room door for them so they could have a look at the gowns that were kept for rental. While her sister, Maggie, was busy searching for a silk gown for herself, Alexis looked on the other side of the room as Mr. Brown assisted her. I'm surprised you didn't receive an invitation, said Alexis as he helped her. She thought it was because the man stitched and delivered clothes for people who lived at the castle. My guess is that a tailor isn't of much importance. I probably would have felt less bad if I didn't know you were going. I mean, you girls, he said quickly, laughing. I'm happy that you're going to attend the ball. Maybe you can come back and tell me how it was? I'll be sure to do that, Alexis said, just before her sister called for her help in choosing the gowns. Worry. Alexis moved along as she looked at the gowns that had been chosen. What about the red one? She asked. Compared to the other dresses, the red one stood out the most. It was made of silk and lace with embroidered beadwork. Alexis waited as Maggie picked up the gown and turned to look in the mirror. I guess it doesn't look bad on me, 
Maggie muttered as she swayed right to laugh before turning to look at Mr. Brown. How much is this one? She asked with a grin. That would cost a whole silver coin, he replied. He wasn't sure if they could afford a whole silver coin for a single gown, as there was also Alexis, who had yet to choose hers. Even Alexis wondered if they could afford it, but her sister surprised her by saying, I'll take it. Alexis, why don't you choose one for yourself? She asked. Mr. Brown, could you excuse us for a moment? Alexis requested. He gave her a nod and left the sisters in the back room. She asked Maggie, Do you have a silver coin? We still need to get clothes for Mom and Dad. Oh, don't worry about that. I've saved some money from what I've received, answered Maggie, who was still looking at the gown dreamily that she held in her hands. It's not a small gathering. People from different towns and villages are going to be there. I would like to see our family dressed well. I wouldn't rob my sister and my family of the joy of going to the castle. Is that what you think? Alexis saw her sister's sad expression and replied, Of course not. It's just that a coin of silver is too much for us to pay for a single gown. I know you aren't like that. Alexis frowned. But you say that you've saved enough. Then I guess it should be fine. You worry for no reason. Maggie said, setting the gown aside as she started to look for other gowns that weren't on the same rack from which she had picked hers. We're visiting the castle. Therefore, we can't afford to look like we came from the village. I don't think there's anything wrong with our village, Alexis said, searching for the gown herself. Nobody said anything was wrong with the village, Maggie said, laughing. When I was on my way home, I heard Daniel Simmons say that he received an invitation to the ball, too. So you can tell what kind of people will be there. They're going to be eligible men. You should find one there, she advised her little sister, who, according to her, didn't know how life worked. I think I'm fine right here, Alexis replied, knowing that her elder sister had plans to marry a man from the ball. I think I'm much more suited to life here. I have you. I'm sure that when you marry the man you want, you'll help us, she added. That I will, Maggie replied with a grin. I hear the king is very handsome and is single. Aren't there rumors about him sleeping with many women? Alexis asked her sister, going back to look at more gowns. They're probably just rumors. It isn't like any of the villagers have ever seen him. The king doesn't invite everyone to see him. People are jealous and will spew any nonsense, Maggie said, taking the red gown she had picked for herself. And who knows? If the king takes an interest in me, there wouldn't be anything to worry about. I guess red is the right choice. Alexis saw her sister, who had a big grin on her face. Red suits you. You'll stand out once you wear it. But then you stand out without it, too. Alexis said, smiling at her sister. Look at you being my personal cheerleader. Let's find you a gown so that we don't impose on the man further. Maggie announced with a giggle. Instead of looking at the gowns that were fabricated in silk, Maggie moved to the other side to peruse those made from different materials. I think I found one, she said, pulling out a beige-colored gown. Compared to the striking red gown that Maggie had picked for herself, she had picked a paler one for Alexis. It wasn't silk, but made of various fabrics. Not having a chance to open and look at the dress properly because of the crowd that stood waiting outside the tailor's shop, the girls quickly picked up clothes for their parents. Paying with silver and bronze coins, they left, thanking Mr. Brown. After the family had eaten dinner, Richard McMillan and his wife returned to their room. He then shared his thoughts regarding the invitation that had been sent to them. It's said that the castle isn't safe. People get lost and disappear, never to be seen again. You might also have heard the rumors about the king. Somehow I don't feel right attending the ball there, he said. It would be rude to refuse an invitation that has come from the castle. 
You and I both know that. It's only a ball. What could possibly go wrong? There'll be masks covering our faces, Mrs. McMillan said as she tried to ease her husband's fears. Also, the girls have reached the proper age, so meeting other men not from this village would do them good. Her husband's frown only deepened further. You don't plan to marry them off to somebody there, do you? We know nothing about the people who'll be attending. Also not to forget, Maggie is a child. Still young. Maggie is a grown woman, and she knows what she wants. She would be helping our family with our current situation. There's no harm with that. Mrs. McMillan snapped, keeping the best interests of her family in mind. It wasn't that she was greedy, but was only hoping for the best for her family, to have a better life. And what about Alexis? Richard asked, knowing how tender the girl was compared to his bold, elder daughter. Mrs. McMillan sat next to him and said, You and I both know Alexis wishes for a simple life. While Maggie, well, you know her, the girl dreams about mansions, servants, and jewels. But if she finds a decent suitor, it might make way for Alexis too. If Maggie were to get engaged, there would be better prospects for Alexis. She thought to herself, Alexis is mature enough to handle herself too. Have some faith that they'll be all right. It's not that I don't. Parents weren't supposed to show a difference in emotions when it came to their children. But Richard couldn't help worrying about Alexis, who was the opposite of Maggie. She was gentle and too kind. Alexis paled by comparison in front of her more attractive sister. But that didn't mean she wasn't pretty to look at. The girls were often seen together. And when a man passed by, it was usually Maggie who caught his attention. And just because their father was more concerned about Alexis didn't mean he loved his elder daughter any less. After some thought, he finally said, I'll ask Mr. Miller if he can lend us his carriage for the day. Preparation to go As written in the invitation, the ball would be starting at 8 at night. It was also noted that everyone would be having dinner in the castle. At the thought of tasting something unique from among the mouth-watering delicacies that most had only dreamt of, people could hardly wait. The journey to the castle would take nearly an hour, and none of them wanted to be late to the ball. After all, it was once in a lifetime. Are you going to be all right? Alexis asked, who was pulling the laces of the corset that her sister was wearing. Maggie held her breath and nodded while she held on to one of the bedposts. Make it tighter, Maggie insisted, and Alexis pulled the laces further so that Maggie could have more of an hourglass figure once she put the gown that she had rented from Mr. Brown's shop on. Okay, this looks good, Maggie announced as she went to stand in front of the mirror. She swayed herself back and forth to make sure it looked as she wanted, and it did. Will you be able to breathe? Alexis asked about the tightness of her sister's corset, which was making her worry just by looking at it. Absolutely, Maggie said with a reassuring smile. Come on, let me help you with yours. Alexis looked at her sister apprehensively. I'll have Mama do my laces. I don't want to die of suffocation, said Alexis as Maggie dragged her by the arm. Don't be a child. If you don't tie the corset with the bodice just right, the gown isn't going to sit well. I want to make sure my sister looks pretty, Maggie said, urging her sister to come forward and stand near the bedpost. Hold your breath, she instructed. And when Alexis did the same, her sister pulled the laces from the back. Alexis exhaled, holding the post so that she wouldn't be pulled back with the force that Maggie used to keep the laces tightly together. Maggie was a good sister to Alexis, and personally, she didn't mean her any harm, unless there was competition involved. She was a good person if things went her way. She liked to be first in everything, and it was something she had felt since she was a young girl. Maggie was ready, as she had finished doing her hair by tying most of it up, while leaving two locks of her hair curled in the back to rest on her shoulder. 
She wore a striking red gown, which fit her perfectly and had a zipper in the back. It was a half-sleeved gown with beadwork around the bodice, and the bottom of the skirt had several layers. The elder daughter of the Macmillan family looked like nothing less than a high-standing woman of society. Do you need any help? asked Alexis, who was yet to put on her gown. Maggie waved her hand before asking, Do you think it looks fine? I think it looks fantastic, Alexis said, laughing softly. What about you? Are you sure you don't need any help? You haven't gotten your hair done yet either. Maggie pursed her lips, looking at her sister. To Alexis, her sister's words were of concern shown toward her. No, I'll be done soon. Why don't you see if Mama and Papa are ready? Alexis asked her sister to check on their parents, and Maggie gave her a nod. Sure, said Maggie, leaving Alexis alone in the room. Alexis finally put on the pale beige gown. Unlike her sister's dress, which was made of silk, the texture of this gown was different, and something she had never stumbled upon in the past. It showed off her shoulders, with a little extra work at the top that emphasized her figure as the dress flowed down her body to touch the floor. The dress wasn't eye-catching, but it was simple, yet beautiful in its own way. There were no pearls, but a lot of delicate thread work, which made Alexis remind herself to bring back the dress to Mr. Brown in the same condition in which she had borrowed it. She then worked on her hair by taking several locks at the front to tie, and leaving the rest, which stopped just above her waist. She used pins to secure her hair while brushing back small strands from the sides of her temples. When everyone was finally ready, they could hear many carriages passing by their house, as a lot of the guests had started to head to the castle to make sure they weren't going to miss anything. Look at both of you. You look so beautiful, Mrs. McMillan said raising her arms to have both girls hug her. When they pulled away, she asked Maggie, Why didn't you help Alexis with her hair? It looks very basic. There should still be time to fix it up. That was because Maggie's hairstyle suited her attire and the place they would be going, while Alexis appeared to have arranged her hair very simply. I did ask her, Maggie said, looking at Alexis's hair, which indeed looked simple and she pursed her lips. She looked at the dress that her sister wore for the fifth time since Alexis had put it on, and said, I asked her if she needed help, which was precisely why she had asked if Alexis needed help, so that they wouldn't be late. That's all right, Mama. Alexis held her mother's hand. Didn't you just say we look beautiful? It should be fine. She smiled at her mother, a smile that had her mother smiling too. Doesn't Maggie look beautiful in the red dress? It suits her well. Alexis quickly changed the subject, but her mother gave her a knowing look before she said, Beautiful as always. Hearing the sounds of carriages and horses again, they looked at the road outside to see their carriage finally stop in front of their house. Grand Ball Hollow, Part 1 There was a reason why Alexis, as well as Maggie, appeared to be looking out the carriage windows with eager eyes, as was their mother. Alexis, who sat next to Maggie, looked outside to see the trees that passed by one after another. The sky had turned dark two hours ago, but their carriage had fixed lanterns that illuminated the area outside as did the other carriages in front of them and behind them, all heading in the direction of the brightly lit castle in the distance. The sisters continued to look outside the carriage, until they heard their father say, Were the Hamptons invited? They've been invited, Mrs. McMillan answered. She'd been sitting primly and properly with a straight back, as if trying to rehearse how to rest in her gown, which was made of silk. Mrs. Hampton kept speaking about it in every conversation with everyone she met, as if the king had come to invite her personally. She wanted to let everyone know that her family was special, so I made sure to tell her and some of them that the king had invited us to the ball, too, she added, 
rolling her eyes. Maggie and Alexis smiled at their mother's words, having seen her knit her brows as she spoke. I'm sure you did that, my dear, Richard murmured. Maggie chuckled and said, It's the king who organized the ball. That's why everyone wants to show off that they've been invited to the castle, too. That's true, Richard said. It must be the very first time that the king decided to invite people like us who lacked when it came to money as well as status, and had always been separated from the rich folks. Do you think the king is a good man, Papa? Maggie asked her father. It's hard to say, Richard stated. Once we reach the castle, make sure both you girls stay together. We've seen the castle only from afar. I wouldn't want my daughters lost, and definitely don't want your mother and I looking for you later. And don't cause any trouble, Mrs. McMillan added. To which both the girls nodded. I heard the castle is huge, almost as big as the village, she added, and then let her husband continue with the conversation. But on the other hand, Alexis wasn't listening. Instead, she turned her head to stare at the trees. When the carriage passed between the massive pillars that supported the castle gates, Alexis noticed the leaves and creepers that decorated the gates. The grounds were vast, with trees and gardens that were beautifully maintained. Like Alexis, there were passengers and other carriages who were busy drinking in their surroundings. Alexis picked up her mask, which was gold in color, tying it behind her hair before they would reach the entrance of the castle. The carriage finally came to a stop, and the door of the carriage was opened for Mr. and Mrs. McMillan to step down first. They were followed by Maggie, moving slowly because she had to make sure she didn't step on her dress. Two handmaids came forward to straighten her dress once she had stepped down, before they moved to help Alexis. Thank you, Alexis said, bowing slightly to the maids after they had helped her fix her dress. The castle was lit up with huge, fiery torches, and it looked beautiful. Alexis continued to stare at the castle, which, in truth, was as big as the village they lived in. Everyone who had stepped out of the carriages had dressed in different materials and textures of clothing that were eye-catching. Please head this way, ladies and gentlemen, said the guard who stood and guided the guests after they had disembarked. Alexis, along with her sister and parents, walked inside the castle, whose wide oaken doors were carved beautifully. There were paintings on the ceilings that were lit up for viewing by chandeliers that each held many candles, and from them hung stones like diamonds that reflected light around them. While the elites continued to walk forward, it was the poor people who couldn't resist gawking at all of the beautiful things that surrounded them. While Alexis and her parents were taking their time looking at their surroundings, Maggie insisted, Let's go to the main ballroom. She had noticed how the people who belonged to the upper class spared them one glance and then curled their lips in obvious disdain. Look at that painting. What do you think it's made of? Mrs. McMillan whispered to her husband. It's probably an oil painting. They still look wet. He replied. Really? She asked, surprised. I would never have guessed. Our neighbor, Milton, has one of these. It takes a lot of time to dry. Probably very old, though. Richard responded to his wife's curiosity. One of the couples who passed by them snickered as they heard her parents speak. And Alexis noticed. She heard the man say, I don't think it's hard to differentiate them from us. And the woman smirked. Even though there were masks on their faces... Alexis could see their eyebrows drawn together condescendingly. She knew the kind of place from where she and her family had come. Though the king, for the very first time, had invited the villagers and people who lived in the town, she wondered what was his motive in doing so. Alexis! Maggie called to her. Let's go! Giving a quick smile, Alexis walked next to her sister, and Maggie took one step forward so that she would be the first one to be seen. Grand Ball, Hollow, Part 2 
Alexis's parents took their own time to look around the castle while she accompanied her sister, who could barely wait to explore and go to the ballroom where the celebration of the hollow was taking place. Before they even reached the ballroom, they could hear music filling every part of the castle. This is going to be a wonderful night, isn't it? Maggie exclaimed to her sister as quietly as she could. The music is so beautiful, yet there's some sadness in there. The castle's magnificent. Indeed it is, Alexis agreed, looking at the many walls and pillars that were part of the castle. Some people walked by, talking and laughing with each other. Several men who passed by looked at Maggie as she stood out in the red dress with beads. Her beauty and gown had caught many eyes in the long, wide corridor. Imagine living here, Alexis, Maggie said dreamily, trying to look around without being too obvious. One would be like a queen. There must be a lot of servants to maintain something as big as this place, Alexis responded. She was sure that, despite all of their walking and gawking, this was just a small part of the castle. Maggie giggled. Oh, Alexis, are you thinking about cleaning the castle? She asked. A tall man who was coming toward them appeared to be wearing clothes that only the richest of the rich could afford, despite half of his face being covered by a mask and the other half free. One could tell this man was handsome, with decent-looking features. As he walked by them, his eyes fell on Maggie, and he smiled. She raised her head and tucked her chin up as if she were the daughter of a duke or lord. He was looking at you, with a whisper. Alexis pointed out the obvious. Do you think he'll ask you to dance later? Who knows? Maggie replied, shrugging. I don't think he's the king. I wonder what the king looks like. How do you know he's young? He might be in his fifties, or more than that. He doesn't want to show his face to us, Alexis stated. There were rumors on both sides, with some saying he was old and some insisting he was young. They started to head toward the ballroom, and Maggie said, That's because he's the king. He shows his face to people who he finds to be worthy. Alexis and Maggie did meet a person who they knew. It was Mr. Keith, who had noticed Maggie, as he was an admirer of hers. Lady Maggie, you look beautiful. So do you, Lady Alexis, Mr. Keith complimented. His eyes focused on Maggie. You don't look bad yourself, Mr. Keith, Maggie replied and smiled politely at the man. Did you come alone? As Alexis listened to Maggie and Mr. Keith converse with each other, she looked around at people who had found someone they knew to speak to. While the guests were entering the massive ballroom, one after another, but still leaving plenty of space for others who were still on their way to the castle, two men stood on the balcony wearing masks. One stood near the railing, gazing down at the guests through the golden mask that covered his eyes. We have many people who have gathered in the ballroom, the man commented, then turned to add, I thought with the minister's words, the castle would have turned into a local market for the peasants, but it looks much better. Pity. I was ready to hang him from the scaffold in front of the church, said the other man, who stood with his back and one leg against the wall. Unlike the first man who had spoken, this one's face was covered entirely by a silver mask. His black hair was combed back, and he leaned his head against the wall with his eyes closed. Any good meals for the night? he asked. There are some decent-looking women, finer and different, the first guy muttered. Hearing the reply, the man who stood against the wall, one side of his lips pulled up behind his mask, opened his red-colored eyes. The Girl in Beige Will you be making your presence known? asked the first man, who took a step back, making way for the one with his back to the wall to stand in front. Let's see, said the man with the full mask. It would have been better to have people of our own class... But I guess it isn't so bad. It isn't every day we get to see the little people who live their lives in burrows, do we now, Paul? He asked. 
I guess not, sir. The man named Paul, who had his brown hair combed to the side, replied with his head bowed. Not everyone has the good fortune to meet you. It isn't hard to differentiate the less important guests from the ones of our own kind. Humans. Said the man as his eyes fell on a couple of people who were gazing wide-eyed at the opulent setting. Fragile and weak. Like lambs when given grass. They'll come and graze, not knowing the butcher is going to cut their throats. Curious and foolish little things. I hear Lady Aria is getting engaged to the Duke. Her parents want her to get married to this man. Paul informed him. Let her be. There are plenty of women like her. She tried to get on my good side, which I enjoyed for a day. But even flattery gets dull. One more day and her parents would have found her floating in the river. The man with the silver mask murmured. Paul gave a knowing smile. The man next to him was hard to please, especially with all the years that had passed. There were only a few things that could capture his attention, and when they did, the king seized them for himself. Your Highness, said a servant who appeared with a tray of wine in her hand. She had her head bowed and didn't dare raise it. The girl's hands appeared to be shaking as she tried to keep still. Paul picked up two glasses and waved his hand for her to leave. He wondered if the servant had been touched, or if she had been warned and threatened so that her hands shook. He handed the king a glass and said, You enjoy the ball, and received a chuckle in response. What's not to enjoy? There's music, food, women and girls with fancy gowns have bedecked themselves, waiting and willing to be taken to bed. Men and women, it's a treat for everyone, said the king, raising his glass to sip the wine through the thin mouth of his mask. Paul raised his glass as if to toast, agreeing with what the king had said before taking a sip. Are you planning to go down, sir? he asked. Go ahead, I'll join the festivities later, the king said. Paul made a bow and left the king's side going to take part in the merriment of Hollow that was taking place in the castle. In the sea of darkness that had been created by the many guests who wore dark clothes, and the many girls who mostly wore red in an attempt to catch the king's eye, he noticed a girl who was in a light-colored gown. And maybe it was the dress, or maybe it was the mask that had slipped away from her face, the ribbons turning loose behind her head to expose her face. His red eyes fixed on her, unmoving and consuming all his attention to the point where the rest of the crowd seemed to have disappeared. She had refined features. Her eyes were expressive, though she wasn't speaking to anyone. Her lips were painted, not with red, but subtle. Her blonde hair had cascaded down her back. Her dress exposed her smooth, delicate shoulders. There might have been plenty of girls who were beautiful, but there was something about this one that had a hint of innocence more than the others. Before he could see more, the girl quickly tied her mask back to hide her face, and a simple gesture had one of his hands clutching the railing of the balcony. His eyes narrowed slightly, and not being able to see more, and he smiled with amusement under his own mask. Setting the glass of wine down, the king left the gallery to make his way down, when Maggie was asked by a gentleman to dance with him, Alexis was in the midst of the crowd with her sister. They danced with the other couples to the music that was being played when Alexis felt her golden mask slipping down her face. She caught it in time before it fell to the floor, where there would be no way to retrieve it with all the people moving back and forth and the gowns brushing across the floor. She tied it back her eyes looking left and right to make sure no one had seen her mask slip, and she released a sigh. Her parents must have been looking around the castle, as she hadn't noticed them in the ballroom. Her sister was enjoying her time dancing with the man, and her parents were surely having their own fun, which made Alexis smile. 
She spent a few more minutes watching the dance before deciding to step out of the ballroom. But when Alexis turned to leave, she saw a man walking toward her. He was well-dressed, like the others, but he wore a mask unlike anyone else's in the room. It was silver, and covered his entire face except for his eyes, which were red. Alexis had started to leave the ballroom, her eyes shifting away from the man to look at the other guests, but her eyes were drawn back to him, noticing him looking at her, and it almost felt as if he was heading toward her. Just as they were about to pass by each other, his eyes appeared to be looking elsewhere, and she realized she had been mistaken. Alexis let out her breath, which she didn't know she had been holding. But before she had taken two steps away, she heard a man's deep voice say, Fair lady, I think you dropped your kerchief. Hearing the deep voice behind her, Alexis turned around to meet the man's gaze. There was something very intimidating in the way he looked at her. A darkness that lingered in those dark eyes. He raised a hand with a handkerchief in it, and Alexis's brown eyes looked down at his hand to realize it was indeed her kerchief. She had been holding it all this time, which made her wonder how it had slipped from her hands. Thankful that the man had noticed, Alexis offered him a smile and said, Thank you. And when she said those simple words of gratitude, they were like music to his ears. He saw how she stepped closer to take the handkerchief, which he had pulled out of her hand without her knowledge when they walked past each other. There was no ring on her finger. Half of her face was covered with the golden rose mask, which was made of cloth. He had seen a glimpse of her face without the mask that came and went quicker than a breeze, but his eyes had captured it. She didn't wear perfume like the others, who were too strong. Instead, she smelled like flowers. Flowers that were scarce and only bloomed in the spring. He noticed the sliver of fear and doubt that appeared in her eyes when she took hold of the handkerchief, tugging it gently, which he didn't let go in the first two seconds. A smile formed on his lips that widened behind his mask, which the girl couldn't see. Alexis didn't know if the person was smiling or not, as his eyes appeared to be looking at her dauntingly. When he let go of the cloth, she finally took it back, tucking it into a side pocket. Would you care for a dance? The man asked. What? Alexis asked. But the man made no effort to repeat his invitation, as he knew she had heard it, and that her reply had come only out of surprise. Alexis wasn't sure about dancing. Not that she couldn't, but she had planned to step out of the room for some fresh air. Wasn't he looking for someone else? She thought to herself. Your partner might want to dance with you first, she said, noticing the way his head tilted to one side. The man raised his hand, this time empty, waiting for her hand. I don't have a partner to dance with. Will you do me the honor? Alexis looked hesitant, as she was apprehensive of him, which made the man in front of her chuckle. Is there someone waiting for you? He asked her. He had been looking at her, studying her since she caught his eye, and he knew she had no partner. Some of the men had looked her way, wanting to ask her to dance with them, but they were still summoning the nerve to do so. This time... Alexis could tell that the man behind the mask was smiling, as his eyes turned slightly smaller. No, I... I didn't come with a partner, she said, only to see him take a step closer to her, and Alexis had to crane her neck to look at him. I came with my parents and my sister, she added, looking in the direction of her sister. Maggie was still dancing with the man who had invited her on the dance floor. Good. It shouldn't be a problem, then. She heard his deep voice vibrating through her entire body, along with the music that surrounded them. Considering that the man had returned her handkerchief, it would be rude to reject his offer, 
and it wasn't like Alexis had been asked by anyone to dance with her tonight. She didn't know if it was because of her blonde hair which she had let down. Unlike other girls and women who had twisted, turned, and braided their hair in various styles, seeing the man's outstretched hand, Alexis finally placed her hand in his, making hers appear tiny. He clasped her hand gently, guiding her toward the crowded dance floor, and the music, out of the blue, changed to a much slower and gentler tune that had Alexis's eyes turn in the direction of the musicians, who had so suddenly changed the tone of the music. Having her turn around to face him, he placed one of his hands on her waist, as the other continued to hold hers. Alexis felt the way his hand didn't stay on her waist, but slid toward her back and pulled her close. In an effort to drive away the silence, as they were strangers, Alexis spoke. What music is this? she asked moving along with him and following his steps, careful so that she wouldn't step on his shoes. It's called improvisation, music that gets better with every century that passes by. He answered, looking at her. Alexis smiled at his description. It would be hard to judge the beauty of music going along with time in terms of centuries. I can only tell how it sounds now. And how does it sound, milady? He asked, humming softly. Suddenly quiet, she answered. Interesting, he said, letting go of her waist so that he could push her away from him, only to pull her much closer than before. Don't worry about stepping on my shoes. Move freely, or else you'll appear to be stiff. He said as she looked up at him. Was it that obvious that I was worried about it? She thought to herself. Thank you for your advice, Alexis responded. Compared to what she had felt before, he appeared to be friendlier, but she didn't know then that he was only deceiving her with his words. I don't know who I'm dancing with, she said with a polite smile. Isn't it customary to ask one's name only after giving yours? Asked the man, continuing to gaze at her without blinking. Alexis appeared distressed at the basic error she had made, her cheeks turning warm and her eyes finally moving up to look back at him. Alexis McMillan. Alexis. Her name rolled off his tongue, a whisper at the end, and she waited to find out who she was dancing with, but he never told her. You didn't give me yours, she said staring into his eyes to realize she wasn't dancing with someone of her own kind. She had heard whispers and stories about people with red eyes, people who lived in and around the mansion. The man happened to pull her closer at the same time, bending her backward to expose her throat to him. She saw the many chandeliers that were hanging from the ceiling until the man with a silver mask came back into view bringing her upright with his eyes still locked on her. As he pulled her up, his warm breath fell on her neck. She heard him say, What's so important in a name, Alexis? Illusion I see you're not scared of the night creatures, the man commented noticing how she pursed her lips at his comment, wetting them very subtly. Alexis knew not to fear when one met a night creature, and they were at a ball anyway. She doubted he would do anything to her that she had to worry about. Is there something I have to be scared of about them? She asked, questioning his premise, and the man behind the mask smirked. Many humans fear such creatures' existence, they stay far away from them, while cursing and wishing them to be dead. Isn't that so? He asked her. I don't think I've come across anyone to fear, she replied, feeling his hold on her waist, gentle yet firm. He pushed her away again, playing with her in time with the music that filled the ballroom. When Alexis twirled around, her dress spun along with her, and she ended up back in his arms her hand locked in his as he held her from behind. So brave. I can tell that I'm the first one you've met. 
he whispered next to her ear. He released her from his hold, dancing with her as she moved with him. You must be working here in the castle. Have you seen the king? She asked him. Alexis felt his hand move around her waist as she spun around to be caught by him again. The king? Yes, I have. Why do you ask? He inquired, his eyes conveying his curiosity. Alexis shrugged, causing the man to glance at her slender and delicate body, which looked soft and smooth. He wondered how it would feel to bite into that skin, and the thought made his hand grip hers tightly as he pulled her close once more. He invited his subjects to the Grand Ball of Hollow and wasn't here. I found it... Alexis started, but stopped. Rude, he completed with a chuckle. I was going for improper, Alexis said as she averted her eyes from his daunting gaze, as it never left her face. She looked at the other couples who were dancing around them when she noticed the men and women who were standing on the sidelines talking. They appeared to be curious about who the couple was, some eyes on the mysterious man and some on the woman who was with him. She noticed Maggie, who was dancing with another man, looking her way, curious about with whom Alexis was dancing. The king must have his reasons for not showing up here. We all have our problems, don't we, Alexis? He asked, and Alexis realized that he wasn't addressing her as Miss or Lady, but instead using her name, as if they were familiar with each other. Are you interested in seeing the king? Is that why you're inquiring about his absence? I wouldn't judge you if you wanted to, he added. I'm not, she replied. A mere interest, then, he muttered in a whisper for her ears only. It would have been nice for him to spare a moment, especially for those people who have traveled from such a distance, Alexis stated. People, said the man. Do you believe they're here only to see a man whom they fear? There are plenty of reasons, and most of them are attending a grand ball. Good food, people to meet and enjoy. It seems like you love the king to take his side like this. The words slipped out, unbidden from Alexis's lips, and she bit her tongue at how easily those words she now regretted had rolled out. The man, instead of looking at her accusingly for not kissing the ground where the king walked, laughed. Seems like you aren't fond of him, he said, looking at her with an amused expression on his face. Alexis smiled. I haven't met him to know if I am or am not fond of him. I have nothing against him. She added that she didn't want to get on the wrong side of the king if her words reached his ears. Don't worry. Your words are safe with me, he said, finally letting go of the hand that was on her waist when the song ended. It's hard to trust him with that full mask on his face, thought Alexis to herself, but the man had created some sense of intrigue in her that she knew she shouldn't have. Thank you for the dance, Alexis, he said, and she bowed. Taking a step back, and then two, she saw the way his predator eyes looked at her every move. She turned to leave, walking a few steps before turning back to see that the man with whom she had danced had disappeared like an illusion. Her eyes swept from the room for a few seconds more before she walked through the crowd of men and women. Alexis hugged herself and rubbed her arms as she moved from the ballroom, filled with people, to a less crowded place where the cold night wind blew softly. She took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. Maggie was busy chatting with a man who wore such fine clothes that it made her wonder if her elder sister had caught the king's eye. Not wanting to disturb her, Alexis decided to take a look around the castle while searching for her parents. While exploring not too far away from the ballroom, Alexis heard someone call her name. Lady Alexis. She turned back to see who had called out to her. She saw a man walking toward her who wore a mask on his face like her, and her eyebrows were drawn downward in curiosity, just before being raised in recognition. Mr. Brown? 
she whispered. 